big city of Spruce there, over where Teeple's store was there. Ross, okay. Yep. So is that, would that be your grandparents at Teeple's store in Spruce? Or? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Teeple's store. And um, so anyway, my family goes back a long way, so that's why I guess one of the reasons I'm doing this. So if you have any questions or comments or corrections, everybody loves to correct the author. So I found that out. So <laughs> feel free to volunteer them. And uh, so or if you have something, a little story you want to share, one that's not too long, you're going to have to really scoot. I don't know if we're going to make it through all four books here, but we'll see what we can do. So if I'm talking fast, that's why. Okay. Um, the books and calendars are for sale as well as my nature pictures up here in the front. I'm going to look at some on the break or after you can. Um, I will have a discount on volumes three and four. Today I'm going to give a $10 discount on volume 463. Volume uh, plot three is 65, so that will be 53 and 55 before today. So, uh, with that, I guess we'll move along. Anybody have any questions so far or anything? Get right into the good stuff here. Also, I will mention, is anybody here from Lost Lake Woods Club? Anybody from Lost Lake Woods Club? Okay. <laughs> anyway, somebody just uh, gave me this, which is from 1926, an awesome historical document on Lost Lake Woods Club. So, yeah. so, somebody wants to look at it, you're welcome. Okay, there's four books. Volume one is uh, 1600 and 1900. Volume two, which I'm sold out of right now. But I'm right. If anybody wants it, I can put your name on a waiting list here, and I'll have some eventually in soft cover. I've sold a thousand of each. I'll buy a thousand of each volume here, and when I sell them out, then I get a small printing and soft cover. So this is volume two, 1900s, 1950s. Volume three, which you have in front of me right here, that's uh, 1960 to 2012, and then volume four is the uh, history of. Hunting and fishing was starting in about the 1800s. Look at the white tailed deer hunting all the way back to the 1800s. Great to present. So that's what they are. Feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. Okay, let's start right out here in volume one. There's an aerial picture covered right there on the first page. Uh, introduction. I can find, where did I put my notes here? No, I think I have my notes ready. Should be in this picture, please. Get over. Let's look at the timeline on the second page here. There's a, there's a timeline in it. Just kind of try and hit the high points here, uh, so you can take a glance at that. There's some pictures of my I'll point it out to you here. Um, the lake was named after Bella Hubbard, here, and uh, he was up here around here in the 1830s. We'll get to that. 1864, uh, there were 674 people in Alpena. Uh, okay. First road to Hubbard Lake was a Gilchrist uh, tote road in the 1870s. And, uh, so, all right, we're going to move along from that. Get into some quotations here. And I'm going to read you a little bit out of this uh, page 11, where it says he's made all things beautiful here. I'm just going to read a little bit out of that. We're all just passing through. Some of us have been fortunate enough to spend many of our days on this earth enjoying wonderful Hubbard Lake in the heart of northeastern Michigan. If that's you, congrats. Sit down and soak up the natural splendor and amazing personalities who've helped make our lake special. If Harbor Lake is not in your blood yet, what are you waiting for? Come on, you're in for a treat. Harbor Lake has been here thousands of years and will still be here after you and I are gone. Harbor Lake is seven miles long and three miles wide. It's a big lake. My friend John Houghton and I, I grew up duck hunting, Rode a 12-foot aluminum boat full of deck decoys, yeah, with a dead seven and a half uh, horsepower Avenue motor attached from way up the West Branch River to the middle of the east side of the lake. Anybody in this room have that happen to you? Your motor conked out on the lake someplace? Yeah, that's fun, especially on a windy day. Trust me, you got to row that far. It's a big lake. It's 8,800 acres. If you're used to hunting on 40 acres, Bob. 40 acres now, vision this, you know, there's 220 of those hooked together. 
That's how big this blank is. So it's big. You just take off your boat and go. It's awesome. One of the reasons we love it. Uh, there are over 20 miles of shoreline. It's so big we have communities of people on opposite corners of the lake who barely know that each other exists. It's over 80 feet deep. So, okay, we'll move along from here. Let's see what we can find next. Uh, the Chippewas, uh, page 13, is about the Chippewa Indians who were here first. And prior to the Chippewa Indians, uh, I went to school with some of the Chippewa Indians. I knew the, the uh, Joseph family from the north end of the lake did a big family. Lyman Joseph was the, the uh, patriarch. And uh, he was a preacher, among other things, and a really hard worker. They said he was an awesome worker out in the field. And I don't know, he had maybe 10 kids or something like that. I went to school with uh, Susan and uh, Edith Bondi. Um, I don't think so. No, let me think about it. No, I think Edith was uh, his wife's sister. I think they were in the same family. And Edith Bondi, we'll see in the book here, she's a famous basket maker from, from around here also. Um, okay, if I lose my chain of thought, you're going to have to bring me back sometime here. But um, before the Chippewa, um, originally the mound builders were here, and there's a map in here of the mound builders. And what we know about the mound builders, it's on page uh, 16. These are some of the mounds that I found. There used to be one right down here at the south end. Doug Reske uh, bulldozed it down when he uh, was right across from where the South Shore Inn is there when he was doing some developing there, whatever. So you can see, and I know the Papanaw Mound, I call it over on the west side of Hubbard Lake, is still there. And uh, my dad used to take me out in the woods, and um, we'd see a, you know, you see occasionally you see a mound in the woods, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe the size of this table that long, a little wider this high or something, well, I wonder if that's an Indian mound, you know, I didn't know, my dad didn't know, well, when I found out what a real Indian mound looks like from the mound builders, around here anyway, uh, it's like 30 feet long, okay, from the end of that table down here to beyond that table, and it was probably, now it's about 6 feet tall, so it might have been 10, 12 feet tall, you know, when they built it, or more, how are you doing? Fine. See ya. And, all right, and uh, so, that's what the Indian mounds look like. If you're looking for the, the mound. They're apparently burial grounds, yeah. Although when they when he bulldozed this when he sent there was some red earth in there and they sent it someplace, Michigan State University or something, and that's how they know it was an Indian mound by what was in there. But I don't think they found any bones in there that, that I heard of anyway. So I don't I don't know exactly. It's been in there from a long time ago. But what and, you know, I researched this, and what mainly what people seem to know about the mound builders is this. This is pretty deep now, so stay with me, okay? All right. They build mounds. Okay? <laughs> That's what we know about. <laughs> so anyhow. Uh, not very many. The, I, that name came up in my research, and mainly this was Chippewa Indians in this area. Before them was the Saganeen Indians. Okay, that's where Saginaw is named after the Saganeans or Salks, that's the same tribe. And the Chippewas are also known as Ojibwe's. Okay, so there was, uh, what happened apparently, the Saganeans were here first, and the Chippewas kept kind of coming a little further south from up in Ontario. And uh, they kept migrating a little further south until they were adjacent to the Saganeans. Now, it's kind of like uh, reading about World War II in an American history book or a German history book. It would be a little different point of view, I'm sure. Okay, So that's kind of what it is there. The, the Saganese, from their side of it, claim that they were just a nice, peace-loving tribe, minding their own business, and the doggone Chippewas kept coming down, and the Chippewas got guns first, and they wiped them out. Supposedly, the final battle was down at Mikado. There's a, a horseshoe-shaped embankment down there, and that's where the Saganines may have made their last stand down there. And uh, so they wiped out all the braves, and then they took the squad and the children, and the Chippewas did. So they took over this area. I think it is. I think it's still there. I, I have not seen it. I don't know exactly where it is, but I know it is in, in Mikado. 
Um, maybe we could get, uh, if you looked in one of Bob Paul Tiener's books, he was really up on the Indian research, okay? Bob Paul Tiener from Alpena. If you go to the library, they used to sell him you know, all seven of his books for 20 bucks. He had so many books stacked away in the material store. But he was Alpena's historian. He was the Doris Gaffney or Alpena. Exactly, exactly. When did this happen? When did this happen? Uh, time frame. I'd have to look in the book to see. Uh, um, page 17, bottom. By the 1500s, the Salk tribe, also called Saganin, dominated this area. They were cha challenged by the Chippewa and Ottawa tribes in the 1600s. When the Chippewas traded for guns in 1690, the handwriting was on the wall. Now here's your Potawatomi right here on page 17. With little written history, details are sketchy, but it seems the Chippewas called the Council War along with the Ottawas, Potawatomis. That just sort of rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? It's a nice name. Potawatomis? Okay. Um, and the Hurons, the Menominees, and the Six Nations of New York to slaughter the Saganese. Okay, now we need to back up a little bit and get the Chippewa side of this story. Was that the Saganese, Saganese were murderous killers, and they just slaughtered off everybody they came in contact with. So that's why they got all these other tribes together, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or like about a dozen of them, and they went to them. Uh, the horseshoe-shaped earth fort down by Mankato was apparently used by the Saganese in their final struggle, and so on. So that's how we ended up with the Chippewas around here, and now I don't think there's any of them left. You know, I mean, I tried to find people, and then other the Saganese. What's that? The Saganese. Chippewas. Saganese are all gone. Uh, all back to Saginaw, I guess, but uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Chippewas, there's hardly any. I mean, the only ones that I know, Barb Abbott, mm -hmm. is um, she's Edith Bondi's daughter. So she was living with John Edie Abbott over to the north end of the lake. I don't know if she still is or not. Is she alive or dead? I'm not sure. The last I knew she was living with the. Uh, she's a great artist. Yeah. Yeah, with her son John. So, okay. Well, we don't want to stall out too much here. Right. But yes. Uh, what's the name of the tribe near Standish? Is that the Squani or the Squani or? Yeah, I know what you mean. Where the the, where the, the casino is? It's yeah, it's Saganine. It's Saganine. I think it's Saganine. I want to go by there. I figured that's where they got this. What's the name of the casino? The Saganine. Come here. Yeah. Saganine. Yeah. Saganine. It's it's both. It's Chippewa and Saganine. <laughs> But, oh, they started learning how to get along? Yeah. Oh, okay. the, the, um, I used to live in Mount Pleasant, and that's all that's all Chippewa. Uh, but the, the casino and the tribe that's in Standish is a branch of that. So it's the Saganing is the name of the casino, but it's part of the Chippewa tribe. So I don't know if they came hand in hand then or whatever, or decided to name it that because of the history. Dick? Possible turn the lights on in this end, so maybe this folks can see them better. Here. Okay, good. Glad you asked the question. Now let's go to uh, page 22. Don't turn your hands up here. Page 22. Okay, uh, well, you're going to find out. I have. I am uh, one thirty-second Mississauga Indian, so um, you might find out I'm a little bit of an Indian sympathizer here, but we'll see. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, here's what the uh, the white man came here and uh, <laughs> speaking with forked tongue. It says they're on the top of page 22. But here's kind of the what happened. The white man came and his thinking. Let's see. Well, and, and here's what they found. This is what the white man found here. All of northern Michigan and over into Wisconsin, maybe Minnesota, up in Ontario, comprised the largest conifer forest in the world. In the world. It was right here. And these trees were up to six feet in diameter. That's as far as I can reach. Six feet in diameter, and 200 feet tall, and 300 years old, and this place was just covered with it. I, I know one person said you could, uh, a squirrel could run up a tree and run across the white pine trees from tree to tree all the way across the Midwest, you know, and never touch the ground. There were that many of these trees here. And what happened out east in the colonies, the 13 original colonies, uh, everything that they made there 
was made out of plastic, right? Mm -hmm. oh, no, no, no uh, metal, right? No. no, no. To begin back in those days, everything was made out of wood. wood. Everything. The boats, the carriages, the houses, the sidewalks, everything. The tools were made out of wood. And so they used up a lot of the wood, and they went up to Maine, and they cut all the, the pine, big pine trees up in Maine to use the wood there. And then uh, you're going to have to tell me when it's about an hour, Richard, okay? Because I don't even have a watch, so yeah. This is going to drag me away or something. These people can leave. Yeah. So anyway, they... We'll, we'll take a vote and we get there. <laughs> <laughs> they used up all the trees there, so then they're looking for more wood. we got to build ships, and it takes a lot of wood for ships and buildings and all this. So they started looking to the Midwest and to Michigan. At the exact same time that the gold gold was discovered in California, and so there, simultaneously there was the gold rush to California, and there was a timber rush to Michigan, and there were more millionaires made in Michigan than there were in California. Okay, and these guys that you're going to see later on in the book, the timber barons, like. George Fletcher, the library is named after him, the paper company, the power company, Fletcher Pond, and he became a millionaire on cutting those big, those huge trees, and they just went through and they hammered them. Is it true they rebuilt Chicago? Uh, some of the lumber from here was, was actually, it was cut here, but not very much of it, because if you think about it, it's not very practical to float logs from Alpena all the way around the Straits and all the way down to Chicago. Maybe something over on the west side of the state might be a little closer, you know, if there's anything left they haven't slaughtered yet. So anyway, uh, they did, I wrote about that, they took one load of actually wasn't the logs. There's a picture in the back of the book, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, but there's a picture in the back here in the middle of the book, I guess it is, of the, uh, one of the log booms from Alpena Tell you what page it sounds you want to go there. Um, page 104. So they have these huge log booms like a half a mile across. They chain them all together, the logs, and then they'd haul them to Cleveland or New York or wherever they're going to saw them up. Or maybe some of them, Russell Alger, who was uh, Secretary of War, he was a general in the Civil War, and he was governor of the state of Michigan later on. He was one of the major uh, woodcutters, timber barons, right here, where we're standing here today. And it covered the south part of the lake, the east part of the lake, and all the way over Lake Huron. His headquarters were in Black River, and originally I guess he was in Harrisville, but they ticked him off there somehow. They probably weren't very happy they did because he spent a ton of money on Black River. Black River used to be like a couple thousand people, if you can believe that. If you've ever been to Black River, I mean, there's nothing there now, hardly anything. Post office. I don't even know if there's a grocery store. <laughs> Not even a post office anymore. Okay. There's a church, though. There's a yes. Catholic church, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's there. Are still there, and a few residences, you know. But that was 2,000 people or more, and he built big, like several stories tall buildings underneath to house all the people from the lumbering operation. But anyway, he was started out in Harrisville, and they kicked him off somehow. I, I do not know how. I'm gonna guess. Though. He was a teetotaler, and he stayed in a hotel over there where I think they may have served alcohol. I don't know that I'm still, but that's one possible theory. So, Anyway, Russell Alger cut a lot of the trees around here and became a millionaire as a result. And the poor guys working on the woods worked for a dollar a day and 30, 40 below, you know, from 5 in the morning till whatever, 10, 11 o'clock at night or something. They got a dollar a day. Where was it that cold? Where was it that cold? Yeah. It was that cold everywhere around here in those days. It was colder than it is now. They got more snow than we, than we do now. And the foremen, they would not allow them to have a thermometer in the camp so that they could see how cold it was. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Psychological, I guess. But, uh, okay. Any other thoughts here? So let's see. Here we go up uh, kind of the top of page 22 on the right here. Let's see. We'll hack down all the trees, eliminating habitat for all sorts of creatures. We'll leave endless piles of brush and top to fuel next year's forest fires. And that's exactly what happened. If you look in the back of the book, page uh, uh, right here, 173, the big fire of 1908, the black stumps, they, I see all out in my woods on the east side of the lake. 
you see in a lot of places are a result of the forest fires that went through in the lumbering days. The biggest one was 1908. It went through a lot of northern Michigan and it just burned everything up. If you can imagine, they're, they're cutting these huge trees. So what kind of tops do you think they're going to be leaving? You know, we, what we call a nice saw log now, that's a top, man. And forget that. We're not even messing with that. And so they'd leave them there. So they'd sit there and dry for a year or two or three or whatever, laying out in the woods, and then a little lightning bolt or a, a locomotive would go by or a campfire or a spark from someplace and things up. They got the whole woods on fire. So that's what the black stumps are about that are still out in the woods. Um, we got one on our lot. Have you? Yep. Well, I have some woodcutters back in my property um, last year, and that was understanding number one. Drive around the gal darn black stumps. I love those things, okay? <laughs> so they can look at me like, what, are you nuts or something? <laughs> yeah, maybe I am, but uh, do the best you can. So you did. You did all right. We'll kill every deer and bear we see. They did. There used to be, there used to be elk here and moose here. And they killed them all. I mean, the Indians had something to do with that probably too, all right? But, but they're, they're gone. I mean, the big targets are going to go first, okay? The easiest ones. We'll kill every deer and bear we see and any other living creature in our path. Then let's take the trout streams and turn them into ditches for channeling logs to market, which is what they did with every stream around here. Sucker Creek, West Branch River, Schaefer Creek, the river we're on our property on the east side of the lake, which is a creek about this wide. Now, and they would put what they call, I've seen them on Sucker Creek coffer dams, and there's just an earthen dam there with a little, you know, open spot where they put boards or something across there. And in the spring of the year, see, the, the only way they had of uh, dealing with all these logs that they cut, how are they going to get them where they want them? You know, how are they going to do that? Well, in the wintertime, they'd haul them with a team of horses and, and a sleigh. That was the only way they had to move them. So, haul them up, put them on a sleigh, and then they'd haul them to the nearest body of water and wait for spring, and then they'd float them out into Hubbard Lake, float them down the West Branch River. Uh, there were 25 lumber companies that had their headquarters at the, at the dam at the north end of the lake. And... Uh, I mean, there's horrific log dam pictures in here. Uh, later on in the book, I'll get a page look there. They say I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I'll have to do what we can do here. What's that? They pile uh, The workers and the the. No, they pile them on the shore of the on the shore of the lake or the shore of the river and mm -hmm. waited for it to thaw, and then they haul them. Or as we may read here, what they did here in this lake was they uh, originally, okay, so we got a big pile of logs at the south end of the lake. We're trying to get it to the north end over here. The, the ice went out. We're trying to get it to the north end. Um, so we can float it down the river. And they float them down the river, all these 25 different companies, with their own log marks. Log marks, log marks, where put those? Where log marks on the end. They stamp them with a hammer that had various log marks. You can pass these around if you want here. Keep on looking at them, see them. And uh, so then they'd sort them out. The Thunder Bay Boom Company would sort them out in Alpena. In the meantime, they had horrific log jams. Uh, Page 100. see some of them. Okay. They had horrific log jams. Pass them around if you want. Um, there that the, the lumberjacks had to break up the log jam. Page 100, she said. Yeah. Okay, yeah, there's 98, 99, 100, uh, back 96. And so these lumberjacks that worked in the camps all winter for a dollar a day, when spring rolled around, now they got all the logs piled up on the shore. They're piled up like Schaefer Creek where we are. This little dinky creek are piled up alongside of that. Well, how's that going to work? How are we going to get a log this big around on a creek that wide? Well, we're going to dam the water up, so much water, and we're going to cut it loose and I've seen our creek, our little creek, when uh, Bear Lake or an all state foot club, their dam broke over their 40 acre lake, I've seen that 75 feet wide. Wow. That is like, I don't know what this building is, at least as long as this building. And so they open up these coffer dams and, and then they throw the logs in there, get them out to Hubbard Lake, 
now if we got a bunch at the south end here, how are we going to get those walks seven miles down there to the north end of the lake? So what they did originally was they waited for a good stiff south wind. Makes <laughs> <laughs> sense, you know? So they'd, they'd boom them all up. They'd, they'd uh, put uh, two or three rows of logs all around the outside of this big boom of logs. It might be half mile, quarter mile across. And then they would uh, chain them together. And the in the spring, as I started to say, they, all the guys that worked for a dollar a day in the lumber camps, when it came time for the river drive, they called those guys the river rats. And some of them ended up in the river. So when it was time for the river drive, the married guys went home. The single guys went on the river drive because some of them weren't coming back. And they got three or four dollars a day for that instead of a dollar a day. So that's just the way it was. And they made these guys millionaires that they were working for. And so that was the original way. Um, they, had, they tried different ways of getting logs all the way across the lake. First was just the chain them together and wait for the wind and hope for the best. Uh, they had a rig, <laughs> uh, which I've written about in there, which they would have a, they'd have a raft, a big raft with a horse on it. And they would take, then they'd have a big anchor. For the, they found some big anchors. I've seen some that they found out of this lake, okay, and probably off of some of these rigs. And so they would take a rowboat. They'd have this big raft with a horse on it and a big wheel on there so the horse could walk around the wheel and turn this wheel, okay? And so they'd take their chain with their anchor and they'd, they'd throw it in a big head rowboat and they'd row it out, you know, whatever, 100 yards or as far as they could go, drop that anchor, and then they'd come back, and the horse, they, is, this whole raft is hooked under their old whole boom of logs. And so the horse would start going laboriously around the circle and cranking this big chain in, and that would move the raft, and consequently the whole boom of logs up until they got to the anchor. And you gotta pull her up again, that, that doesn't sound like much work, does it? <laughs> And then eventually they came, they came up with uh, steam-powered uh, rigs. Let me see. I'm so far ahead of myself. Oh my gosh. If you look on page uh, 93, there's a logging tub there. And that was taken from Hubbard Lake. And there were a couple of them, a couple of different boats that were named the same thing apparently. The Bull of the Woods. And uh, so that's the, the Bull, the Bull Cook was the guy that cooked in the lumber camp. He was called the Bull Cook. So I don't know, but they called these the Bull of the Woods. And uh, there's a couple stories in here about some of those tugs, steam powered engines on that pulled the log booms across the lake. And then eventually they worked up on page 92 here, the Florence M, which was a uh, 30 foot, I think it was, a steamboat that went across Hubbard Lake. It was brought from, uh, I'm trying to think, Long Lake or someplace here? Yep, Long Lake, it says on page 95. John McDonald brought the Florence M. So there's pictures of it there, and they use that to drag the log rooms in the spring all the way over the dam and then float them down to the river of the Alcana. And they also use it on the 4th of July, as you can see on page 95, to give rides around the lake or they get dressed up and charge them a buck a piece and away we go. Okay, now to go backwards here. Chippewas, we got some of the modern Chippewas here, and then Jim Tash, a gold buddy, so up and up. And there's Edith Bondi on page 24, in her porcupine basket that she uh, has in the Smithsonian Institute, amazing craftsmanship, and her sister, uh, Edna, Edna Joseph also made baskets too. So you find a basket around in the garage sale, it says uh, Edith Bondi on the bottom or something, or, or Edna Joseph, you got a real keeper there. Which I just thought they were something. <laughs> so, uh, all right. The same basket that's in the Smithsonian is at the Besser Museum. Yep. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Oh, all right. Cool. Well, I was on the board there, we uh -huh. bought it. Okay. It was good enough for the Smithsonian, it was good enough for Besser. So that's the very same basket. And she was saying. alive then, she okay. made it for us. Oh, I see. So it's similar to the one in the Smithsonian. It's the same thing. Similar yeah. though. 
well okay uh, well we're going to skip to some of this uh, page 28 Harley Blue Francais uh, a lot of French trappers in there you want some good reading though on page 29 Sandy McDonald's Man written by R. Clyde Ford that's about uh, uh, trappers up in Mackinac City and uh, uh, it was trapping was uh, a huge thing I mean, it was, that was uh, before the lumber company, the lumbering, the, the timber barons came in here. That was the only source of revenue in the North Woods was trapping, and they made big money, supplied a lot of furs over in Europe. And so you can read about that in there a really little bit about it. But that's a really cool book to read. Sandy McDonald's Man, on page 20, uh, 29. You've probably heard of the uh, John Jacob Astor. What's well, a Hudson Bay Company? Yeah, that was one of the big fur companies. In there. It was pretty nasty business. If you were in competition with the Hudson Bay Company in trapping, you were very likely to end up dead. So, that worked. Yep. so surveying the prospects on page 30, David D. Oliver was one of the first sellers here over in Austin, and he uh, was influential here in this area also as. Doris Goth here, as uh, Lucille mentioned, our local historian here in Alcona County. Um, on the bottom of page 30, in 1839, David Oliver was hired by the surveying team of Lewis Clausen and, and Thomas Patterson. But anyway, uh, that was, uh, he was one of the early, I guess it was David Oliver here, he bought 79 acres for $99. You know? and, uh, <laughs> when one survey member took his modest wage in lieu of a generous section of Michigan turf, he said, see this guy, the word for Dave, well, Dave Oliver, said, uh, you know, you want to take land for this or do you want money? And he said, Dave, that worthless land ain't fit for nothing but skeeters, bullfrogs, and engines. <laughs> oh well, that's what they thought of that. I know the same thing happened in Lower Michigan when uh, President Madison, I'm not sure, he sent surveyors to uh, to look at Michigan, see what Michigan was like, you know, and see if we could you know, maybe have a state there or something. And they they got, went down there in Lower Michigan someplace and said, now it's all just rattlesnakes and Indians and swamp. It's all it is. It's worthless. Michigan's worthless. So they didn't pursue it anymore until mm, past. Governor Cass, I think he was a maybe early governor, maybe the first governor of Michigan. So he went to the president, might have been Monroe or Madison or somebody else. And he convinced them, hey, this Michigan place is okay, all right? You know, this has got some, some potential here. And so that's how we ended up getting developed. Here. There's nothing going on in Michigan really at all, uh, maybe a little in the lower part of Detroit, uh, until the timber companies came in, the timber barons came in. And about 1870, I figured they came to the Hubbard Lake area, roughly. And uh, as I said, that was the same time as the gold rush out in California. All right. Picture of Bella Hubbard on page 32 here. He's who the lake was named after. He was an assistant to uh, Dr. Douglas Houghton, who was the uh, Michigan State geologist. And so Bella Hubbard was his assistant. Of course, Houghton Lake is named after Dr. Houghton, and Houghton County in the UP, Dr. Houghton. Well, Bella Hubbard got one for him, he got Hubbard Lake, so they camped over on Doctor's Point, the story is there uh, on page 32. All right, now we're going to meet of this here. Uh, this is Timber Mania here, I call it, where the, they started uh, on page... Uh, 36 and 37, there's some of the highlights there, dates of interest from the timbering, which you might find some interesting things there. Um, page 41, you'll notice the map on page 39, they didn't even know Hubbard Lake was there <laughs> on the map. Of course, they didn't have satellites then, Doug, so they couldn't get this exactly right. You know, but they, kind of, they kind of got a little uh, funny over there in the west side of the state. <laughs> Uh, no Hubbard Lake, 1839, so I don't know where you are. Okay, page 41. Let's see, our population there. 
see the Michigan population, 1805, there were about 400 people in Detroit. We got up to about 5,000 by 1810, 9,000 by 1820, on up to 200,000 by 1840, and by 1860 there were about 750,000, so that's how many people. But, and back in those days, in the late 1800s, no money, no jobs, no nothing in northern Michigan except timber. That was it. That was it. That was the only jobs. Was the only, that's how they got people to work for a dollar a day. That was the only dang job. So. No fishing? Fishing? Oh, yeah, there fishing. probably was a little bit of fish. Yeah, they were, they were fishing before that even. But there were some fishing jobs out there, but not a lot. Not a lot. You are right, though. Okay. Uh, what do we got here now? Okay, this is uh, page 43, as Russell Alger was telling you about it. It's one of the timber bearers, cut right here. And uh, along with Fletcher and, and Herman Besser, uh, Jesse Besser's father, Jesse Besser, my dad worked for him at the Besser Company. Your husband worked for him, right? Yeah. At the Besser Company. Yeah. Howard Kelm. And um, so he got his start in the timber business. That's what he made his his money to start the best company, you know, the best. Uh, and probably others that I don't know. And everybody else, uh, their businesses, their retail businesses, or whatever, if they had a stable horses, or groceries, or whatever, all that money, a lot of it came from bars, or restaurants, whatever, the money came from the timber business. All right, let's look at, um, page, where's uh, George Fletcher's picture on page 45? Page 47. This is a local guy here, Samuel Holcomb. And uh, there's over at the end of East Bay. I should have a map right in front of me. There's a map right here. I do have some maps up here uh, that are for purchase if you want. Really, maps are probably available. Anyway, at the end of East Bay, this is Holcomb Creek. Runs up here, kind of forks out here. This is probably the Holcomb branch over on this side. And uh, so that's where this guy was from, Sam Holcomb, H-O-L-C-O-M-B. And uh, so these are guys are pretty interesting fellows. He was kind of a small time operator here. Uh, he was born in New York in 1832. He and his sons, Edward, Joseph, and Sam, were primarily in lumbering and farming their entire life. Sam cruise timber throughout the state of Michigan. We're going to get to that. Timber cruisers. The timber cruisers, the timber barons were the ones that said, okay, there's money to be made out in the woods of Michigan. How are we going to make it? We're going to send out timber timber cruiser or cruisers, and they're going to find 40 acres with some beautiful pine on it, and we're going to race down to the land office, and we're going to buy this, and then we're going to cut the timber. And when, you, when they got 40 acres, they cut what they called a round 40, Ross, a round 40. That would be 40 acres and everything around it. That's a round 40. <laughs> 40 Nobody's there to, to enforce anything. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, that's what they did. So here's old Sam. Um, at one time, he owned 2,000 acres surrounding Hubbard Lake, which he later sold for a dollar an acre. Ooh. Uh, he operated a lumber camp in the early 1900s, and he was 68 years old at this time. Um, it says, I expect, that, as I wrote here, I expect the sons were doing the work by 1900, since Samuel would be 68 years old. After reading the following poem, I'm not so sure. Here's the poem. It was 1900, and the wages were good, and most of our boys had gone up to the wood. Sam Holcomb was lumbering on Hubbard Lake shore, and the boys gathered around him a dozen or more. Some came from Kindy, I guess these are towns. Some came from Kindy and some from Capoc. One came from Speaker, the heart of the pack. Short-legged and shaggy, his hair was quite fine. The cooks dressed him up to have a gay time. We went out to Spruce to take in a ball. The jug that was there got many a call. Sam Holcomb had plenty of good whiskey slang, and it kept him, kept him in a hustling when Dolly he'd swing. Next was Ed Holcomb, the best man we had. He'd walk around camp and slap all the lads. But Dad, the sidekicker who drove the off ox, wouldn't slap him 
but his ears he would box. Dad went to town and some bitters he got. They were not very strong, they were not very hot, but it made him quite wiry. It would make your sides crack. If you saw him that day, he put Ed on his back. Whatever. <laughs> That's the point from back in those days. All right. Moving right along here. Where we had on and on. Okay. Here we go. I'm on this sheet over here. Okay, timber cruiser that I was talking about. Now, if you can imagine going out into the woods all by yourself, most of these guys went in pairs because it was pretty much suicide to go by yourself. You know, I mean, if you tipped over in a canoe or something out in cold water, if it broke a leg or even just twisted your ankle, you know, and you're 50 miles from anything, you know, you're in bad shape. You don't have some help, you know, somebody to carry you or build something to drag you on or whatever. So anyway, the timber cruisers. So they would go out, and they were rough customers. They would go out into the woods, and they had to be outdoorsmen that uh, could live off the land, you know, and sleep in the rain and whatever else, you know, and forage for food and everything else. So they'd go out and I don't know how they ever <laughs> located a piece of land. I went to Alaska <laughs> years ago, and they staked a 20-acre gold plain. Okay. And so I went out there and I got on a little creek, Traverse Creek, up 50 miles from the Arctic Circle north of Fairbanks. And uh, well, I'm going to stake this gold claim. Well, that's great. How am I going to identify this land, you know? So I just went out next to the creek and I, I paced off what I figured was about 20 acres. This is what the gold claim was supposed to be. And I blazed the tree over here and walked, paced it off over there, and blazed the tree over there, up and down the mountain and everything, you know, the whole 20 acres. There was, a, there was a, a level ground about the size of these two tables here. I think there were maybe four tables, and that's where I started building a little cabin. That was it. The rest was all up and down. And everything. So, so and then I went back to Fairbanks and registered my claim on Traverse Creek. You know, it was good. So I guess that's what they did. Did you find any boat? What's that? I did not. Oh. No. <laughs> I probably the no, only thing I would I found something shiny in the bottom of the gold pan. You know. I think, if, I think it would be very appropriate if it was fool's gold. Because that, that was pretty, uh, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing, but, okay. So anyway, the timber cruisers were a rugged customer. Let's uh, look at page 51. All right, we're talking here uh, about the lumber camp, so it's on page 50 here. And this is a poem by Henry Thompson, who lived at the... Upper Lake Village at the north end of the lake here. There's a picture of Henry Thompson on page 132. If you look there, you can see what old Henry looks like. But here's the poem. Uh, it was O'Grady and De Placey, likewise George and Al, these are names of work of the Son of the Lumberjacks, you've chosen of our number the lumber for to fall. They were sent out in the forest to find trees were sound, the trees that were sound, and soon they brought the lofty tops of tumbling to the ground. All the names I will mention, as you will understand, there was 25 in number, all good and able men, all working with good courage while scattering to and fro. It was their delight coming home at night to see their landing grow. The landing is where they piled all the logs. You know, that's money in the bank for them. But soon the scorpion came to us, as you shall hear, it was in the month of January, just 12 days from New Year, January 12th, when Charlie came and told us our camp was burning down. Our clothing and our bedding were ashes on the ground. When the boys heard the news, they all felt very sad, saying we've lost our place of shelter and all the clothes we had. At night, coming, a cold night coming on us and nowhere to go, the skies were our covering and our beds were in the snow. Although that night it passed off right, for cold we did not fear. We waited there with watchful care till daylight did appear. And when the daylight came at last, like ravens we were fed, like in the Bible, Elijah was fed by ravens, uh, Patrick stepped out in the yard, and unto us he said, My boys, at last the night has passed, with many a chilly pain, let's all take hold like heroes bold, and build our camp again. Three days of hard labor, that's all it took them. Each man did his best to get our camp built up once more and have a place to rest.
third night by lamplight, we moved in our camp once more and settled down both safe and sound as we were once before. Henry Thompson. So that's the kind of hardship they had to uh, deal with. You know, it's not a lot of fun, I'm sure. All right. Question. Yes, sir. Question, question. Yep. Mike, I don't think the people assembled here realize that you cut the wood in winter right. because you could you could well they spray the, 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 the sleigh yeah, the only you way they the path exactly make it icy and then the horse could draw it out right. a lot easier that's so the only way they could wood move cutting them. was all in winter yep and the colder the better yep because they want they made ice they actually had uh, mm -hmm. which I have a picture in the book uh, a little bit later on there of a, of a sleigh with that had barrels on water on it and then it dripped out in the tracks to ice the tracks for the slaves to go you know and uh yeah so thank you uh, so that's what they did until um number one the big wheels came to being which uh again i'm getting ahead of myself but we'll look at it in here uh find the page for you here my grandfather huh a mile over right on page uh, 61. You'll see those huge wheels. Other at Hartwick Pines. That's the only place in Michigan that's over in Grayling. Hartwick Pines uh, Park over there. I don't know if it's a state park, probably. Well, there's another place. Um, Is it? Peak, okay. Uh, Lake north of where? Lake Fanninghole and North of Lake Fanninghole. Another stand of virgin white pines. I was yes. saying, okay, and then the one in, in, it's the one they want in the lower peninsula. So anyway, that's where this picture was taken. That's my grandfather, Milo Thompson, on the left. That's me on the right, and my brother standing on the left. Page 61. So then once they invented the big wheel, they could just uh, chain a, uh, a huge log on the bottom of that. Okay, they didn't have to lift it up and drag it along with horses. And so now they could, now they could really wipe out the timber because they could cut in the summertime. And then to top it off, the railroads came in. And that was, that was the end of the, they just wiped everything out. Yeah. Narrow wiped. gauge railroads. So narrow gauge, yep. Yeah. And I have maps in here of the narrow gauge railroads with some of the uh, logging spurs there. And that was the covered lake railroads. Pardon me? It has railroads. Yeah, mm -hmm. read the book. Uh, if you look, there's a, there's a map of railroads someplace in there. Uh, okay. The railroad map is on page. The north end and west side, and there were some here on this side. 87. Thank you, 87 is the railroad map. Okay, let's read a little bit here about the, uh, oh, this is taking a long time. About the lumber camps themselves here. On page 53, the top of page 53, the men's camp or bunkhouse was often a low, squatty, rude structure, like you see at the bottom of page uh, 53. Uh, the largest bunch houses were about 30 by 60. Uh, two tiers of rugged bunks along the wall and a dirt or wood floor. An 8 by 8 fire pit. And originally in the middle they just had a, you know, a bunch of stone piled around and built a fire in and a hole in the roof and that was it. That was the heat. And later on they got wood stoves. And It depends how uh, big and well to do a company you were working for what you got there and then and the food was similar and dependent some of the camps you got uh, uh, beans and uh, salt pork a little bit of salt pork and a, maybe a cup of tea or something like that you got that three meals a day on winter you know some of the camps and unless somebody happened to go out and shoot a deer or something you know for a little change of pace but that was about it and others were pretty fancy pretty fancy food yeah so anyway, I want to get to the deacon's bench here. If you see up here, the deacon's bench up in the top paragraph on page 53. Uh, our deacon's seat was magical in the lumberjack's memory. There they would sit in a jolly row. They had benches around the fire and warm up by the fire to joke with each other or sew up their long johns. On the deacon's bench, they would dress in the morning, peel off soggy, smelly clothes at night. You need to look at... Uh, uh, the picture on page, come on, Mike, where is it here? I've got a picture there. You can almost smell the picture. <laughs> <laughs> on page 68, top of page 68, 
It's got socks and boots and everything there. I mean, oh my gosh, yeah, that'd be horrible. And all the suits are all night. That stuffy camp with a bunch of smelly old lumberjacks that probably didn't take a bath all winter. And their long johns that never changed all winter. I mean, oh boy. Yeah. And sometimes in these, you get to sleep in shotgun bunks. That means that that's a bunk bed like this that are built. So you get as many in as possible, and there might be two bunks or three bunks high. And so you got it's kind of like on a anybody here in the well, in the Navy? Yeah. The Navy? It's kind of like a bunks in the Navy there. Are they're they're not real uh, spacious, are they? You know what? Huh? The bunks? The bunks in the Navy, yeah. They're about this big. Yeah. <laughs> not, not too much headroom or anything. Three in a row. Up. Yeah. There you go. That's what they. That's what they <laughs> have. They call them. They call them shotgun bunks. Because the only way you can get into them, so you can get lots of them all along the wall here, you got to crawl in from the end like you load a shotgun. Yeah. See, so that's yeah, there. Where that came from. Oh. So, and, and sometimes you had to speak, sleep, two of you had to spoon in those bunks, okay? Are you into spooning or not? Is he into, did you like spooning? Yeah, I like spooning. Okay, he can walk fine then. So you might have two of you or even three of you sleeping there. It was fun smell you got. Oh, it was passing bean gas and everything else. Oh, my gosh. Must have been lovely. <laughs> lovely. Yeah. So anyway, uh, on the Deacon bench, they dress, they just pick up her smelly clothes at night and listen to an itinerant salesman or preacher. This was on Saturday night, normally. And Raleigh with the camp deacon, who was maybe if somebody could pay, play a fiddle a little bit, or somebody could tell jokes, or somebody could sing, or wave it, anything, anything that was the least bit entertaining, I'm sure, uh, they were the deacon, and they got to entertain people on Saturday night. And that was the only day they had, you know, they, they got to let their hair down Saturday night, and they got Sunday off to, uh, you know, wash their underwear and whatever else, clean their tools, sharpen their tools and stuff, you know, and that sort of thing. We did get Sunday to do that, but that was it. Okay. Uh, so, we're going to move along here. Uh, there's a map on page 56 of some of the lumber companies around Hubbard Lake, and there's lists of some of the Hubbard Lake sawmills and lumberjacks. Now, the lumberjacks were technically on page 58. They were not called lumberjacks. We call them lumberjacks now. They didn't call themselves that at all. They were shanty books. That's what they call them. Shanty books. So, because well, they lived in shanties. Oh, what? That's what they called them. You know, so that's that's what it was. So, okay. Um, what have we got on here? Well, let's go over this shanty boy. Let me see where I can find this shanty boy. Okay. Now, on the top of page 59 here, uh, John Fitzmorris, another great book to read if you want to learn about lumber camps, The Shanty Boys by John Fitzmorris. He describes a railroad car. Now, these guys would come by railroad from Saginaw or someplace downstate once the railroads were in, which was, now I'm trying to think what that was, probably uh, maybe 1880s, someplace in there mid-1880s. I have them in the book someplace, but I don't recall exactly the year. But anyhow, so they'd come by railroad, come to the job. So let's, they, and you had all kinds, you talk about a melting pot. You had a few Indians, not very many. Uh, you had uh, French Canadians from uh, from up in Canada, where they were logging up there. And they would have, this, I couldn't find one as a bright red, but they'd have a bright red sash that they'd wear, the French Canadians like that, tied around their waist, and they'd also wear a bright red chook on their head. And that's mainly, if you think about it, you want to be seen when you're out there in the woods in the middle of a lumbering operation, you know? And if you can imagine, I mean, we had a couple guys cutting on our property, and so you got one guy cutting and another guy in a machine, you got to know where each other are, and you got to know there's nobody else wandering around in the woods, or you're going to be dead, you know? So that's what they did. They had a bright red sash in the hat, especially the French Canadians. So you got French Canadians, you got some of them from immigrants from the old country, from Poland, from Norway, where they were being persecuted there, and they were taking some king or dictator was taking all their crops taking their sons and put them in the army, taking their houses away from them, their land, 
and it was awful. And so they heard that we'd come to America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. So they did. It took them like from mm, I think maybe several weeks on up to three months to get across on a boat. A lot of them died on the boats of diphtheria and all others. Different dysentery and different kinds of plagues and everything. But when they got over here, some of them came along, some of them brought their families. So they, here they are on Ellis Island, and I have uh, later on in the book for the Bart's family, I have a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think what you call it, manifest, okay, that shows the whole Bart's family there that came over to Ellis Island on the boat, and then it tells what they brought with them. Uh, and so they get there and they say, well, here we are in America. What do we do now? We got to earn a living, you know. What, what are we going to do? And so they hear there's money to be made in Michigan. And in Michigan, you can homestead 40 acres. And if you live there for five years, you can own it. Boom. Okay. Solves our problem. So they come to Michigan and they homestead 40 acres. They clear off a little piece of land, maybe the size of this building, build a little log cabin if they have their family with them. They put them in the log cabin, and then they go to the only source of money there was in the lumber camp and work all winter for a dollar a day. And then they'd come back in the spring and hope that their family didn't freeze to death, didn't die of some disease. Some Indian came through and killed them or took them, whatever. Or some bear didn't get them, whatever. They didn't starve to death or freeze to death, whatever. So. Man, what a what a deal! You know, so here, these are all these guys from all over the place that came to Northern Michigan. Some of them came from Saginaw, where they were logging down there, and they come up. They call them Saginaw boys, and they were they were a little different breed. They didn't fit in too well with everybody else. They thought they were better and tougher than everybody else. You know, Saginaw boys. And so you read about that up here a little. There was lots of conflict in these camps. Don't worry. Some of these, some of these guys were criminals that you know were just trying to run away from their past. Okay, John Fitzmorris, top of page fifty-nine. He just in his Shanty Boys book. He describes a railroad car it was full of every form of the word. The seats were intended. Uh, it was full in every form of the word. I'm sorry. The seats were intended for two who held three or four. The aisles were jammed with surging, roaring, swearing, laughing humanity out of nearly every kindred, nation, people, and tongue. And all these guys can't understand each other. They don't speak the same language. All were full. Every man had a bottle. The men bound for the woods. A long season of hard labor was before them. This was simply goodbye to civilization. The combination of people was made up of Americans, English, Canadians, Germans, Swedes, French, Poles, and Indians. And all were hilariously noisy. Each man was using his mother tongue, which matches a song, joke, or wild argument. As fast as one bottle was emptied, through the window it went, and another took its place. I since learned that the gathering of bottles along the railroad was no small means of livelihood of the lumber town small boys. The reek of tobacco smoke filled the car, the roar of song, and vile word. Don't you wish you were there? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But anyway, that just gives you an eye, a little feel for what it was like. And these are the guys who were in the lumber camp, trapped in this small little, little uh, environment here. All right. Uh, let's see what else here. Moving right along. This is a guy, uh, page 69. Okay, we're here in the middle of the left side of page 61. They were trying to describe for you the lumberjacks and their situation from these old books and the words of the lumberjacks themselves. They were hardy woodsmen, physical giants in, the, in their line who followed the lumber camps as their trade and means of subsistence. They came here to work in the lumber woods intending, as soon as the pine was gone, to fold their tents and move further west. But many of them remained. My grandfather was one of them. He worked in a lumber cap camp down by Mikado, okay, and over on the west side of the state too. And his his father lived worked in a lumber camp in Mikado. His pictures in the book later on. Others were patriarchs, uh, 
be it understood, left this country for the country's good. <laughs> None but the brave and industrious worked in the lumber camp and stuck to it in those days. They'd be brave and industrious. Only the strong survived. The killing in the middle of the morning, Grandpa Milo would have a sandwich that he took along with him. He'd eat the sandwich. Then they'd bring you lunch out in the woods. All you can eat. Again. In the middle of the afternoon, my grandfather would have another sandwich in the middle of the afternoon. And then when he, after dark, all you can eat. Was. And he was losing weight because he was working so hard and so long on the woods. I don't think so, no. No, they didn't allow alcohol or gambling or women in camp. Because you can imagine, those are all really good um, fuses for some major conflicts, okay, all three of those items. So they were smart enough to outlaw them. If you were doing that, you were done. Go on, hit the road. Done with you. All right, let's see what else we got here. Page 62. Yeah, I'm going to skip that. Page 65. Let's see what kind of clothes they wore here. Um, top right of page 65. Oh, yeah, let's. All right. Um, let's look at the bottom of the left hand side there. No down vests or hand warmers here, just you, leather and wool against the elements. Freezing fingers, wet boots, worn clothes, bring it on. Some went without ear flaps or scarves to prove how tough they were. Cauliflower ears from frost, frostbite were common. Just to show how tough you were. I don't know where to put my ear flaps down. Nah, not like that. One winter, of the mer mercury dropped to 54 below. The thermometer for abandoned camps as they affected attitudes on cold days. The boys usually wore bright colors to be seen by choppers in the woods. Their feet and legs were encased in long woolen socks, usually bright red, which are drawn over the trousers and reach a little below the knee. At first glance, especially at a distance, the wearer appears as if he had uh, knee breeches. Cloth overshoes and rubbers were worn over the feet, except in wet weather, when high top leather boots were worn. And now donning his Mackinac, which is a coat of many colors, and pulling his Scotch cap well over his ears, the woodsman shoulders his axe and sallies forth long before the morning stars have finished their song. So, and then uh, John Fitzmorris, a lumber camper here, said, I was dressed in good warm woolen pants known as Canadian gray, blue woolen shirt, German socks, walking rubber strapped to the ankle, French head covering, a variegated nightcap, and a heavy overcoat. Added to this was the inevitable red sash, emblem of the words and badge of the shanty boy. So anyway, there we go. And you did, all these could be purchased at, I'm trying to think, this is escaping me right now, it's in the book, at the camp store. <laughs> Can't think of what it's called right now, but at a fairly unreasonable price. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry. What's that? Um, sorry. No, no, they had another special word for it. It's a, somebody, if you keep looking in here, somebody will find it. And, uh, uh, you can tell me when you find it. Okay, the, the bull cook, you see a picture one on page 67. If you wanted something to eat in the lumber camps, uh, you'd best be on good terms with the bull cook. If you didn't like the cooking, you don't get anything to eat. You don't complain about the cooking. So, so there's a, uh, uh, well here, I don't know. Here, Anyhow, there's some pretty cool stuff in there about the gold and gold section. 66. Uh, about a quarter to uh, bottom of page 60, oh, 68. Billions upon billions, bottom of page 66. Billions upon billions of board feet and fell in the Thunder Bay region alone. To the simple but skillfully wielded tools of men who were artists with the axe, saw, and wedge. The timber they fell helped build the nation. Okay, here's some of their tools. Here it is they use, which I have up here. Um, this is a uh, 
Misery whip here. What some would call it. Two man cross cut. They also had one man cross cut with just one hand line, but that wouldn't. This is what they really used to really do business with. Two guys on each end. And I said in the book I read about where one guy he said, "Well, I went out and saw it with uh, a Polish fellow today. I don't think that's a term he used, but and he, he was on the other end of the saw. He said a branch fell. He said hit him in the head and killed him. So I had to carry him out, and take him, take him out to his wife. You know, that's just every day." So and so, uh, you know, a, a pile of logs fell down on somebody. Every time I ever go by that Amish sawmill on Spruce Road on the way to Alpena, there. Every time I go by there, I'm not over there. Every time I go by there, I pray for those young Amish men with those logs. I mean, they pile, how high they pile those logs, you know? And it doesn't take much to just get those babies rolling, especially when it's wet out or something, you know. So anyway, so and so was killed when logs fell on them up the pile today. That kind of stuff happened all the time. Um, so you want to leap forward Mike. a little bit there and find a picture of a saw blade in there for me? You can, if you find it, let me know what page it is. Mike, do you have, it's just like, does anybody need a break? Well, this Mike's on a roll, we'll let him keep rolling. Well, we'll just break in a second as soon as I finish this thought. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. 71. 73, okay. Is that where the picture of the saw is? No, there's a picture of the teeth of the saw. 74. Okay, so the original saws, all the original saws, and I have one of those, a piece of one of those, one, just had, was like this right out here in the end. All the teeth were the same. Those were the original saws that they designed. The problem with that was it doesn't clear the sawdust out of the hole. That's what these are for, these fork teeth here. They're called raker teeth, and that clears the sawdust out of the hole. So when you had a saw that was just these teeth here like this, which the early ones were until, whatever it says there, 1876 or something, or when did they, when did they give the year that the raker teeth were invented. But anyway, if you had the early saws, you could saw a tree, you could hold the, the saw, you could saw logs up after they were down, but you could not because the sawdust would clear itself out. Mm -hmm. But when you're sawing this way, horizontally, it you know, would clog right up with sawdust. You couldn't do it. So that's why you see in an earlier picture there, if you go back, uh, the, you'll see a guy chopping the tree down. You know, so well, why the heck is he chopping that great big tree down? Why isn't he sawing it? because they didn't have the raker teeth on the saw yet, so they had to chop them down. And then they saw them up once they got to the ground. So, so uh, okay, well, you can come up later and look at this. I won't, I won't pass it around so it's sharp. Uh, well, it just depends. Everything has been cut here and there and everywhere, you know, so so it's, yeah. it's hard to say. On our property on the east side, we have some white pine trees that are this big around, you know, the, the biggest ones. So um, that's the next generation after what they cut, I would assume. Okay, this was, they cut them all down by, uh, you know, 1890 maybe or something like that around this, this area. So we're looking at 127 years later. Um, that's a big tree. How old were the ones they cut that? Uh, probably, some of them were up to maybe 300 years old. Mm -hmm. Huge trees. David T. Theology used to say that the only virgin timber was the headline over on Ludwig. 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 Yeah. I wrote about that. Yeah. Yep. And he said that his dad, and of course, nobody, not everybody knows where they live, but they live almost to the end of Sweet Road. Mm -hmm. But after the wood was all cut, the water was all cut, you could see Hubbard Lake from the end of Street Sweet Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could you could see a uh, long ways when they cut all the trees off. You know, Fred Will used to tell me from back in Lost Lake Woods, but you could see Lake Huron out there mm -hmm. and all that, the trees were. Okay, well we'll take a short break then. If anybody has any questions, you're on look at something. Feel free. Okay. <laughs> them at the south end here, three of them, uh, 
And we're going to get into that in volume two, which we're going to skip over to real quickly here before we're going to get through this. Um, I told Dick that this is possible for me to do justice all four books here in a two hour session. I just can't do it tomorrow. And, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm into too much detail or whatever. But anyway, we're on volume one here. But, so we may, at, at Dick's pleasure and his organization here, have another session here to try and hit on even you know, more heavily on the later volumes, okay? Uh, so keep in touch in the field, let you know if that happens. So um, anyway, are there buildings? I know three of them at the south end here. Larry Schlack was in used to live in one of them, he just sold his house. Anybody know Larry Schlack from South End? But do you know who he sold to? I met those people. No, I don't know who he sold them my book, but I don't remember their name. But anyway, down by where the South Shore Inn used to be, if you turn left there, yeah. that used to be uh, off the water, used to be Bacchus Resort. That's yeah. still there. That's where Larry Schlack. That's Larry's her cousin now owns it. Yeah. What's that? Ben her cousin owns it. Bought that. Okay. All right. Yeah. So there, in the original Bacchus Resort, by right? Os Bacchus, the guy who named Mount Moriah, had an early resort here in about 1890s, 1880s, maybe. And people came from all over the country to his resort. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself again. And his other uh, building down there, he had three buildings there. Bacchus Resort, the bullpen, he used to have a lot of big time poker games in there, and those were both off the water. And on the water, he had Uncle Tom's Cabin, which burned down in the 30s. There's pictures of it, all these buildings in the book. And then there's one other one, the picture's also in here, right down by where the South Shore Inn is. If you turn right along the water, and I, I'm in a real estate business, it just so happens. I have that place for sale right now. And there's a picture of it in the book, and it was, so it's got to be 140 years old or something. It's the original lumbering headquarters, okay? So you can buy it for 135000 if you want. I think, I think the question was, are there any lumbering camps, the camps, remnants still camps? exist? There's were on the East Shore where I understand that the house was um, one of the original lumber bunk houses. And right next to it was the house where they ate and everything like this. Hmm. I'm so not aware of that. Side, I don't know. And I think it's Comstock was, were they on the east side? Comstock, they, yeah, Comstock Cotton over there, there. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. there was the well, I'd, like to, I'd like to hear more about that. I'd like to go see that and find yeah. it or talk to somebody about it. There used to be, as I wrote in the book, there used to be an old lumber camp on the back of our property. You can see where the, there's, there's, uh, about this high where the rotted logs from the walls are all the way around and an opening for the doorway and it was probably, uh, oh, I don't know, 25 feet long, something like that. And there, so there's another one that I know. So there's a few of those around, but I'm not aware of any buildings that were still there. So. Okay. Well, let's finish up volume one here. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this with any kind of sense at all. Just, just, yeah. Matter of fact, when I'm talking about it on page 69, the place I have for sale for 135000 is right there. On page 69, uh, the lumber camp, the scutters on it now, right there. A lot of page 169. Look at how the lake looked then before they, before they put the dam in there and raised the water level on So. Wow. Anyway, there's a lot of fun things in here that I like from the uh, from the lumbering stories. On page 78 is a log mark chart there. Uh, I don't know if this went around, but this uh, passed around. If anybody wants to look at this the log mark in the end of this, raise your hand if you do. It's been around, okay. Uh, those are stamped in there. And uh, this is a... Uh, Cheap stick here. They call it with the uh, the scaler was a guy who would take a big pile of logs and he could he would scale that and it would tell you put this on the log edge of the log and see how high it went up here and that would tell you how many board feet you get out of that log if it was so so long. If it was a uh, I don't know how to do it here, whatever, but it would tell by the length of the log. And this diameter of it, how many board feet you can get out of it. It's called a cheat stick, the scale of you. I guess so. Nobody got cheated. Or did you cheat that? And, and uh, so that's what that is. Um, the other tools that I have here, um, just to finish that, you can look at the railroads here on page uh, 85 and on the railroad map on page 87. And uh, the Dams on page 89 there. 
picture of uh, on page 91 of the, of the top of my right, that's what it looks like. And then the log jams on page uh, 96, 97, you said. But here's some of the uh, tools that's used. This is, you might think is a cant hook, but it's not. A cant hook does not have this point on the end of it, okay? So a can hook is just for rolling logs, you know, wherever you, and they, I mean, they're, they're awesome tools. You can roll, I can, I can roll a log, you know, just figure around all by myself with this tool right here. Now well, maybe, it's not too long. <laughs> Definitely two men can. But this is called a picaroon, and this is what they used on the river drive. So they could jab it into logs, but they could also roll logs with it, so all this picaroon. Okay. Very, very much similar to a can hook. This is a broad axe which you would use for making cabins, for making square logs. So you just stand on the log like this and like that. I don't know exactly how it's like that. Swing along. Good way to chop your foot off for sure. But I know that Elmer Giroux used to live at the North End of Lake. Maybe somebody knows that name. He used to make his, his living with a broad axe square enough logs. This is a picker, or a, uh, an adz rather. That's similar for making logs flat and stand here like this and just swing it like that and make the top of the log flat. Just so you know, I just built three log homes so I know how to use these things. Let's see, what else did we... Uh, oh, this is the... the uh, oh, what, did I tell you, what did I tell you, Dick, when I came in? I can't remember, I'm trying to think of the name of this thing. Anyway, they use it on the... Uh, a pipe pole, yeah, right. It was not for steering pipe pole, no. Um, but they'd use that, you know, on the, the river rats that use it on the, on the drives. So it creeps a long way from that. Anybody wants a closer look, definitely go. Okay, the rest of the book here. The last part of the book is about early uh, settlers from that time period. Can I hit the high point? Pioneer dates of interest on 108. That's on page uh, 117 is Lazar and Joey St. Charles. Anybody here go to the St. Catherine's Church in Osney? No. Yep. Okay. So that original piece of ground was five acres that was donated by Lazar and Zoe. Um, what the last name was right now? St. Charles, yeah. My wife's uh, great grandparents or something. Um, one, page 115, John and Alan Ellsworth were the first settlers at Hubbard Lake to North End Lake. Their farm is still there. Uh, Scott Road, a mile uh, west of Hubbard Lake Road. West of Hubbard Lake Village. That's how Tina County. They were the first settlers at Hubbard Lake. Yeah. Yeah. What's with the name of Raya and Maria? Okay, well that was... Uh, Os Bacchus, we'll get into volume two. Oh, is that Skip ahead here. He's the guy that named it, Mount Moriah. I'll show you a picture of Os Bacchus here. He was a piece of work. That's all I can tell you. He was a, a major, well-known storyteller and liar. Okay, that's how he's described. This is Os Bacchus right here, right here and right there on page uh, 23. And uh, he, as I said, he named Mount Moriah. Apparently, he didn't know that it was it was uh, how it was spelled in the Bible. Okay? <laughs> it's named that Mount Moriah is where Abraham took Isaac up to God told him to take him up and sacrifice him. And so now you don't have to do that. Just just a little test there. Uh, so that's what it, that's how he got the name apparently. And so he spelled it like Maria instead of Moriah. That's what everybody I talked to. That's what they call it. Well, Austin, Austin know the difference, but okay. I love the picture here. I'm just going to skip back and forth a little bit here. But if you, you don't have mine, too. Let me uh, pass this around. We'll just start it down here. I only have, I'm sold out of this. I'm, if you want a volume two, I'll take your name on the waiting list. I'm already taking it in there, so. How soon before we get them? How soon? I can't make any promises. Oh. I don't know. I got to i got to get enough names, it's going to cost me several thousand dollars. You want to loan me several thousand dollars so I can get this? Uh, you want to take it? Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so
So we'll see if I get enough names soon, then it'll be sooner. But anyway, on page 24, I love this, I'll have to show you. Um, this is a picture of Hubbard Lake. I don't know exactly what the year is, but it had to be the 18th something. Right? But this is the south end of Hubbard Lake here. If anybody goes down and looks at the south end of Hubbard Lake now, it's a zoo. Yes, yes. That's, it's when, when the hoist and the docks come in, they're starting to put, put in the spring. There's what I call dock wars. Yeah, whoever gets there first. I have a picture in one of the books, and then there's a couple of docks and hoists that are out, like on, I think I took the picture on Easter Sunday. And man, a mint ice will boom right there, and there's snow on the docks and the hoist because they want to get them in there and get their spot. So this is before all that happened. Back, I love it myself when in the fall of the year when all the docks and hoists come out. Yeah, this is, this is how it really is supposed to look. You know? This is how it looked back in Osbacus' day before the 1900s. And he's put here, the caption says, Hubbard Lake, Austin Bacchus, and in parentheses, small letters there, it says, what's it say at the end of his name? In small letters there. His lake. His lake. His lake. Yeah, it was his lake. He didn't see all those people seven miles away in the north end that were there 20 years before him. No, it was his lake. So that's bad. He told Paul Bunyan stories and all my bad time, I can tell you. That's Os Bacchus. He was a very colorful fellow. Here. I'm not aware of any. No, could be. Could have been. I'm sure he's been a dancing guy. I've got some information for my travels with two of you. Yeah. Okay, this would be uh, my great grandparents, Ambrose and Roxy Thompson. I'd love to read the, the story of her. Um, uh, maybe I can. Uh, I should take time. Um, I should. Anyway, she, he worked at a lumber camp down in Mikado, and then when the lumber camp moved up, he just said, hey, they just abandoned the buildings. You know, he said, I'm going to bring my family up. We're going to live here. You know, and they probably went back for, after they cut all the timber, they just let the property a lot of times yeah. go back for taxes. They didn't care. They got what they wanted, the timber, mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, so he gets this, they're down in the thumb, Roxy and the kids. So he goes out and meets them at the boat, and they come, Roxy and the kids come off the boat with Roxy and all the kids and the cow. Okay. And he's got the wagon, and so they go over, and he proudly takes them to the lumber camp, where it's going to be their new home, you know. And so Roxy's, <laughs> oh, well, let me see if I can read it anyway. The cook shanty that Ambrose took his family to was their new home, and he was happy that they would all be together again. As for Roxy, she had envisioned something else. A home to her was like of her, that of her parents, down the thumb, a log house, or like the one she left back in McGregor. When she saw the cook shanty, she could not believe her eyes. But Ambrose said, Whoa, to the horses. And the children hooped and yelled and jumped out from the wagon and took off to explore their new home and surroundings. Ambrose helped Roxy down from the wagon and they pushed open the shanty's creaking door to enter. If on the first look Ros Roxy was disappointed, it was nothing to compare with how she felt as she entered and viewed the inside of the yeah. new home. As she looked about, she saw a rusty, dirty, and grease-covered old cooking range, which had been left behind when lumberman abandoned the camp, a handmade rough board table, some benches and the cupboard set, and a dirt encrusted pine flooring. The log walls had many large cracks. Ambrose had removed the bunks from the old bunkhouse and placed them at one end of the cook shanty. When Roxy inspected them, she found traces of bed bugs and knew the family would be eaten alive in these bunks. Roxy was near to tears, and her discouragement was indescribable. Then, Looking at Ambrose, Mason, this is your great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother. Then, looking at Ambrose, she saw him smiling as proud as punch <laughs> and could hear the children laughing outside. She knew instinctively that her husband, wow, what a woman, and children were happy. And it was then all up to her to smile through 
for unshed tears and get down to work. I'll tell you, some of the most, the most amazing people from those days were the women. A lumberjack. always Lumberjack. There you go. There's my grandfather in his younger days, Milo Thompson. That was his mother, A.W. Telling that last story there. All right, we got to move on from this, but this is just about early settlers from that time, the Great Fire of 1908, and so on. So, uh, anyway.